The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Okay, so in this session, we'll move into the science applications and uh, potential science that can be done from an airship platform. And so I'd like to uh, introduce Randy Friedel from uh, JPL. He's the Deputy Director for Research and Engineering and Science Directorate. And uh, before that, he was Chief, science, Chief Scientist for Earth Sciences and Technology and uh, has also served in, uh, at NASA headquarters uh, within Earth Sciences Division of SMD. Uh, his uh, expertise is in atmospheric chemistry and the kinetics and physics of gas particle interactions in the atmosphere at high altitudes and uh, has uh, been involved in producing lineless, line broadening, and uh, strengths and so on. And he's going to talk to us today about uh, opportunities in earth science and in atmospheric studies from airships. Okay, so thank you, Lynn. Um, so we're going to take a, a slight turn here. All the, the great talks uh, from this morning, I was listening to those and, and realizing two things. One is that there's a lot of differences between uh, pursuit of earth science and astronomy. Um, but I think the very most important thing for us to grapple with this week is the similarities, which is uh, effectively that airships for earth science will be part of a portfolio of ways of doing our science. And airships, I think, have a lot of opportunity in earth science, but they also have to find a fairly narrow niche of opportunity. But I think that niche may be much greater even than what I heard on the astronomy side. And the idea that we'd have to couple together uh, earth science opportunities with uh, astronomy type opportunities, I think, is a good one and we'll probably need to pursue that as the week goes on. Okay, so I'm going to start, uh, since this is a short course and we, we have such a wide variety of audience here today, that I do want to give you uh, some sense of what the challenges are in earth science uh, right now before I kind of segue into what I think is going to be, at least in my mind, the, the best opportunity uh, to really exploit airships for earth science. And let's see, does that work? So earth science is really, these days, is, is tilting more towards really uh, addressing societal challenges. Um, there's a big, big science foundation to that, but more and more we're becoming aware that the output of our science really has to start to tie itself even more directly to the challenges. Now, as denizens and citizens of the globe. We all have a pretty good sense of that, but I'll give you a little bit of background that um, you know, some of these challenges are in energy. Um, we burn a lot of uh, fossil fuels, and in fact, you know, human-induced greenhouse gas emissions, about 80% of that is due to burning of fossil fuels. Um, you've probably seen, and you'll see it, uh, here's an example. Um, Emissions have continued to grow of carbon emissions on, around the globe, uh, and CO2, uh, CO2 concentrations are rising. They continue to rise. It continues to be an important problem uh, for us to solve as a society and still uh, have the energy sources to meet our, our needs uh, uh, as a society. Water. Water is... Uh, Probably uh, there's been articles that have talked about that future wars will be fought over water, not oil. Um, there's questions about poor sanitation, unclean water. Um, a pretty striking, striking uh, metric is that, uh, you know, right now we turn over, as we as human society, we turn over quite a bit of the fre available fresh water. So, you know, there's only about... Uh, a very small percentage of all the water on the globe is actually fresh water, and then a very small percentage of that is actually available because most of the fresh water is tied up on ice sheets. So when you really think about the available fresh water that we use for drinking and, and others 
and other uh, means, uh, we are cycling through quite a bit of it and then having to purify it and return it. Um, we don't have a lot of margin for error when it comes to droughts and things like that. And finally, urbanization. You know, we're, we're increasingly becoming an urban society. And in fact, uh, by 2030, the predictions are that 60% of the population will be living uh, in urban settings. Um, and there will be these mega cities, 23 cities with more than 10 million inhabitants. Um, so with all of the, uh, you know, as you can imagine, all of the air quality issues, uh, sanitation issues, um, you know, even today, um, there's estimates that up to one million people die prematurely due to um, diseases associated with urban air quality. And these are estimates. Yes? Is that global or is that this, these, are, these are global numbers, estimated global numbers. Now, not to mention our societal issues, but then, of course, we have natural ha hazard issues. And then you can look at statistics over time to get a sense of what we're going to be facing like in the next decade. And so, you know, pretty much uh, the averages are about 10 or so major earthquakes uh, every year. That's the statistics uh, here. So magnitude 7 to 7.9s. Um, you know, if you look at even magnitude 6 to 6.9s, hundreds per year, 100 to 200 per year. And, and, and then these colossal quakes, you know, about one-ish per year. So, um, you know, if you, if you think about the next decade, the, the globe is going to see, on average, about 180 major earthquakes. And, and, and obviously preparedness and being able to maybe forecast those better is an important challenge uh, for the science community. The earthquakes, of course, some of them, especially the major ones, can create tsunamis. And the statistics on those tell you that over the next decade, you get about one damaging tsunami per year on average. So again, n not a really frequent event, but certainly when they do happen, um, uh, th their effects are huge and we, and we know about it. And so trying to predict these things and give warning is a major challenge. Um, also, extreme weather events. You probably have heard a lot of discussion about extreme weather in a, cli in a changing climate. And, and, and predictions indicate that one of the, the major impacts of climate change, of warming climate change over the next decades, will be, uh, you know, you hear a lot of people say, well, don't worry too much about a one or two degree uh, average temperature change. And in some senses, that's true. Um, but what a one or two degree weather change can, temperature change can do is lead to very much more unstable weather regimes. And so even now, the statistics tell you that, you know, in, in, in the Atlantic region, as you know, we, we typically have six to ten hurricanes per year uh, in the Atlantic, and, and some of those make land in, the, in the North America. So this will probably increase with time in a global warming scenario, but even, even if it doesn't, we, we get hundreds of these things on order of 100 worldwide um, over the next decade. So again, these are the kind of challenges, societal challenges, that earth science is, is motivated to try to, to assist and support uh, solutions and predictions too. That led to the decadal, the NRC decadal survey uh, put out its decadal report in 2007. And you will see in their, their big key questions that there's this merger between fundamental science and then the, the societal drivers. And so they had a list of key questions and just, a, just some examples. These questions were like, well, what would catastrophic collapse of the major ice sheets uh, do? What would be their impact? Um, will droughts become more widespread in the western U.S. and Australia and sub-Saharan Africa? Um, how will this affect wildfires? How will this affect rainfall amounts in various areas? Um, how will continuing economic development, uh, you know, uh, lead to changes in air pollutants? So, again, they're asking a lot of questions that are all very tied into how well you understand the feedbacks between uh, the atmosphere, the oceans, and the land. But, but they all have direct ties to uh, our ability to prosper as a society. So coastal and ocean ecosystems, how will they change? How about uh, diseases? Will they become more widespread, certain kinds of diseases in a warming world? 
And again, as I mentioned about uh, weather events, will heat waves and tropical cyclones become more prevalent or more frequent and intense? So these are the kind of questions that the earth science community is, is trying to, to solve. And I really want to stop and, and sort of then summarize what the approach to that within the science community is. And my, my perspective on this is that there's, ooh, that didn't show up very well, let's see. My perspective on that is that really there's sort of three big pillars to uh, earth science in pursuit of, of the, the big questions that I had posed on the last, uh, the last two uh, slides. The earth system process is sort of the, you know, that's the foundation of earth science for, for many decades now. We're trying to understand the earth system. Um, and, and there's basically the approach there is to isolate the components whenever you can. Uh, by various experimental and modeling techniques. So that's really where the community has been for a very, very long time. Um, but where we want to move in terms of pursuing these societal benefits is twofold. One is this question of what is the climate response? And the climate response, of course, is a very long, uh, long-term uh, phenomenon. And so, whereas in earth system processes, you can try to get at these things by very intensive, very focused experiments that can be maybe a day or a few days. Uh, when you're talking about global system response, your observational foundation has is, is really got to be on the same time scale as the phenomena that you're trying to study. And, and so this is a major challenge for longer term um, things. And so the, the NASA program, for instance, you know, has been doing a lot of this and, uh, over the last decades. And the current program has two components, basically. It's called the Venture Class Missions, which is airborne, um, some very low-cost satellite uh, missions. And, and by and large, they still are trying to tease out Earth system processes. The strategic missions, which cost more and are usually multi-instrumented, um, they are trying to be up there. These are satellite missions that will try to stay in orbit for five to 10, maybe longer years, to try to map out not only Earth system processes on a global scale, but start to set uh, some baseline foundational data sets to understand global response. However, so, I'm going to show you a lot of work that's really been going after these. Where I think that airships can really, really help is in this third leg, that in trying to really take our science and apply it to the, um, the challenges that I showed you a little bit earlier, you really have to get down to the regional scale where people live and, what they, and, and, and the effects on them in, in a local and a regional sense. And that requires looking at things over a longer time scale, but also looking at it at much higher spatial resolution. And, and I think that that's where we're going to spend a lot of time talking over the next couple of days um, with regard to airships and earth science. And I'll get back to that a little bit more. But measurement needs. So regardless of, whether, what, of those three pillars that you want to address, NASA and, and, and the nation and, and the world, really, have developed a tremendous number of assets to study Earth science, even in the Earth science, in the process realm, but even moving to long-term records. Um, these, this is sort of shorthand for some of the key questions that I asked on the earlier slides. And I just don't want you to read all this, but trust me, there is, a, there is just a lot of instruments that are out there operating hundreds of instruments, everything from passive to active systems to sounders to imagers. Um, the, it's a pretty mature field, although the technology keeps driving us harder and harder to higher quality instruments, smaller, more miniature instruments. So there's no shortage of instruments to put on an airship. It's really the question of, does it fill a niche? for doing the science and the application that we want to do. 
Okay, so just a short point about, so what have we been doing with all those instruments within at least the NASA realm uh, for the past few decades? Well, the first point is that NASA does have a very highly capable observing system, mostly based in satellites. And currently, between NASA and NOAA, there's 20 spacecraft orbiting above us or sitting still in geo uh, right this second with over 100 instruments uh, parked above us looking at all these various aspects of the Earth system. So a lot of, thing, a lot of measurements are, are happening as we speak. But because the rising prices of these things, um, the NRC Decadal report pointed out that we are not replenishing the satellites at near the rate that we did during sort of the golden age of Earth observation in the late 90s, the mid to late 90s, the early 2000s. And so the prediction is that unless these things just keep lasting and lasting, um, this fleet will start to decay. And, and that's another motivator for thinking of other ways of collecting the important data that we need. Um, I can't help but show you that the satellites have really helped understand Earth as a system in terms of its processes, um, almost like a living organism. And so these different measurements uh, piece together a mosaic that's just absolutely stunning in what it reveals about the complex interactions between all of the various components of the Earth system. I think most of you can probably appreciate that. Um, but moving a little bit more to airships, Aircraft have always played an extremely important and complementary role within NASA to the satellite program. They do it in two ways. They go out and make these detailed measurements of those processes I talked about. They also help to validate the uh, on-orbit uh, satellite assets uh, to, to ground them in, what, well, in some sense, a, a ground truth, if you will. Um, this is is a great shot of a, a, a large swath of the NASA fleet was in one mission that I was uh, privileged to, to work in. This was the NASA Crystal Face mission in the early 2000s, 2002. Uh, it was staged out of Key West. It had six NASA aircraft. I don't see, think you see them all there. Um, and we're going to look at some of their performances. But um, this is a, just a really outstanding sense of collecting a lot of aircraft platforms together with a, quite a few instruments. And in fact, the, the, the plane that I worked on, oops, 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 going the wrong way, sorry. The plane that I was working on is way over here is the WB-57. And here you, we heard about the uh, ER-2, the U-2 was with us there. Um, just to give you a sense, the WB-57, which is, can carry a very large payload up to pretty darn high altitude, so it can get up to about 60,000 feet and carry about somewhere between five, uh, about 5,000 pounds uh, payload is its maximum payload. And we had 17 in situ instruments on this particular flight, so you could really cram a lot of instruments into one platform. Um, but, of course, it's a pretty intensive effort, and so it's a lot of people. We probably had 200 scientists and instrument scientists out in the field for a whole month. So, you know, this thing, just the intensive of one month studying clouds and uh, aerosol processes over sort of in an in a equatorial environment over uh, Florida probably cost about $10 million for the, for the staging of this experiment for a month. So we tried to fly every other day on average for the month. Um, we probably didn't quite make that, but that's sometimes we'd go back to back depending on you know the, the situations as they came in terms of convection that we were trying to study. But that's sort of the duty cycle. And they'd be up for about five or six hours. Yes, they do. No, we did not. So this is the uh, 926 platform. The 928 is the one that Johnson runs for the Air Force, and it does have lots of really nifty remote sensing on it. 
The ER2 was our remote sensing platform. This was the in situ platform. OK, so I'm still trying to convince you that we've got lots of instruments to work with. And just to give you another sense of that, if you look across the, so I'm trying to connect a little bit more to the astronomers now. <laughs> if you look across the wavelength scale, this is just JPL instruments, um, by and large. Yeah, I think it's all just JPL instruments. So we span all the way from uh, one micron, uh, all through the microwave region. And, and you can imagine there's probably five times that many, uh, or 10 times more instruments uh, internationally in other NASA centers. So it's, it's a powerful uh, suite of instruments. Always improving, though. There's lots of improvements. And in fact, our airship study may point the way to some uh, tailoring of some of these instruments. OK, but I want to turn now to sort of my plea to the group, or at least uh, motivate some thinking uh, for the week on this aspect of Earth science that I think is really a sweet spot for, um, for airships. And that is this increasing focus on regional scale processes. It's where the science really meets the societal challenges and needs of the sort of the public and the, and the deci everyday decision makers. And the instruments, so I've tried to show you that we have an overwhelming number of these things, but more importantly, the instruments are getting better at doing high spatial coverage with good resolution in whatever wavelength they're doing. So apertures are improving. Um, the technology, the detectors, as within a, in astronomy, uh, are the detectors are helping Earth science. And so we're seeing things like, you know, this is the, this is the Southern California Bite. Um, I believe this is um, some current uh, and upwelling after a wind event that could be seen by radar. Here is uh, a burn area over the local mountains out here um, and, and with uh, associated smoke plumes. Um, so some color images to show where the burn areas are based on some color imaging. So we're able to start to do this from aircraft and space platforms. Yes, Jens? Uh, this one is from space, and this one is from, uh, that is probably from space. Yes, space. They're all space. I believe they're all space. Jeff? Craig, I, I agree with you. The regional scale. Is there a, is there a, a distance between the scale that's helping you find regional in the sense, you know, for different science cases, i.e., you know, the color or uh, other things like that? Because, you know, airships are going to probably put you in a certain. So it depends on the question. Um, I'm going to show you one example where I can give you actually some quantitative sense of that for snowpack. But you know, for greenhouse gas, I'm going to show you a slide on sort of megacity greenhouse gas emissions. There we want meters to you know tens of kilometers would be nice. Um, so it, 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 it depends. It depends, but anywhere from meters up to, you know, tens of kilometers, I would say, is the, is the sweet region. Um, just to give you a sense of the fact that, you know, the interest in, in science information on regional scales is growing. In fact, the state of California puts out every couple of years a assessment of the risk of California of a changing climate. And they're relying on whatever data they have, but mostly model calculations. Uh, the data is not as great as it needs to be yet. But you know, they're looking at lots of interesting impacts, like you know, in an extreme warming scenario, which I, I don't know if we're hopefully won't get, but we could see a 90% loss in our Sierra snowpack if we get that much warming. So uh, you can you can read through. There's lots of potential impacts to the state of California through a, a, through a warming climate that, you know, we need to get a better handle on. These are, uh, I'll, I don't, I'm not afraid to say it as an experimentalist that some of these models are in their infancy, so you have to take a little bit of this with um, some skepticism and an appreciation that they need a lot more data um, comparisons to vet these, uh, these forecasts. So back, Jeff, here's the example of 
just giving you a sense of how well you have to measure these things or model them to actually um, understand reality. So these are models of wintertime precip rates. And here's the observations of the precip, basically snowfall. And models right now, um, you know, a global model it usually has a 300 kilometer uh, grid spacing. And you can see that it doesn't quite get it. <laughs> so you really have to get to a, a model that can get the, say, 40 or 50 kilometers um, to, to even start to get the right features. So clearly, if you, know, you want to vet these kind of models, then the observations have to be on that scale or better. And, and so that's sort of the target, and, um, or better, for this kind of phenomena. The other interesting thing about regional predictions is, you know, especially in climate, is that temperature increases. Most models agree that the, the Earth is warming at some, some rate. So even though there's a lot of models spread as you go further out in the forecast, they're all warming. But that isn't true when you get to these sort of regional impacts. So this is asking the question, well, what's the precip change associated with these warmings? And you can see that it varies from increased precip in Southern California to less precip in Southern California. So it actually changes sign depending on which of these, four, which of these ones you're using. So again, we're not going to sort this out until we have a little bit better data records at the, at the right kind of scales to tease it out. OK, so the observation strategy, I've given you some hint of that already. The arsenal that NASA has been using does include aircraft um, as well as satellites and ground-based to some extent as well. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go through some of the, what I've come to learn about the NASA fleet and, and sort of what its, what its uh, strengths and weaknesses are. Now, clearly, aircraft enable a much more flexible observation strategy. And, and so, again, in the regional context, um, you, you can ask yourself, well, if you've got to really check out sort of like this region, the California, if you want to concentrate on California, for instance, in fact, in the early 2000s, some flights were done to try to look at uh, agricultural um, agriculture and map that out. And they did fly up and down the state. And, uh, and these were sort of their flight paths. Um, and you can imagine that if you really want to cover the state with a, a sort of a commercial type aircraft, um, you probably need about five flights need to do it in probably about 35 hours. So a typical flight experiment, so, and that would be just to cover it once. So that would be taking a snapshot. It would take you about uh, 35 hours to get a snapshot of all of the relevant sort of agricultural parts of the state. Um, and at about five to $10,000 a flight hour, just the flights themselves would cost you about uh, $350,000. So that sort of gauges. but. But of course, then you can, you know, you can get some pretty good high-resolution information uh, on whatever whatever the parameter, geophysical parameter you're you're after. Um, okay, so that's sort of a general thing. Now, the the NASA fleet is quite large actually nowadays. Um, it's come upon lots of different uh, platforms to try to do different types of science. Um, the ones I showed you in the picture are the high flyers, um, but you notice they have pretty short duration. So um, that's the limitation on them. Um, you can get lower and get higher resolution or get below various you know, cloud structures or other things that might impede uh, looking down at the Earth's surface. Um, but then these things have a lot less, well, some of them have less capacity for payload. Some have lots of capacity for payload, um, and, they, and they're good at various things. The point I really want to get out of this slide is that if you want to get long duration uh, data sets on whatever phenomenon or event you're trying to look at, it gets pretty sparse. 
The Akana has been used a lot to look at wildfires and help the Forest Service track wildfire progression, and they can stay up fairly long, but their payload is really, really small. Uh, the Global Hawk is sort of our, uh, our latest uh, prize that uh, we got from Northrop Grumman. I think there's two of them in the NASA fleet. And, um, and, and it has a duration 30, and it can do a lots of terrific things, especially uh, for looking at in situ processes at the tropopause. So, so that's one very important asset for trying to go to longer duration. Okay, well, once you go to the satellite regime, if you're trying to do regional scale stuff, you quickly realize that if you're doing low Earth orbit, you're probably only going to get maybe one shot per day of a region, um, if you're lucky, depending on the orbit. Sometimes you won't come back to the same point for 16 days, um, it, you know, depending on your resolution and your swath width. Um, so LEO is not the best way to really do regional scale observations. Just to give you a, you know, we've optimized the OCO2 missions so that this is just a real case example where we're trying to look at regional levels of CO2 emissions. And if you look at the, the California region, what you find is that there'll be six passes per day um, over California. But of course, they don't, they don't actually look at the same place. You won't come back to the same place until every 16 days. So that kind of gives you a sense of what kind of snapshot you'll get of regional, regional scale phenomenon. OK, so you can go a little bit higher if you want to try to get back to the same point more often. And a, middle or a medium Earth orbit um, can do that. You can actually get, uh, by good trajectories, you can look at a place like Los Angeles or California about six times a day uh, from a MEO orbit. But of course, now if you want that high resolution, you're going to have to have a much larger aperture. And of course, there's other problems with, uh, in the radiation environment in MEO2 for optical instruments. Um, there's an interesting one called the Molnaya orbit, um, where it loops up and it sits over the Arctic. Um, it's a highly elliptical path. And it'll sit for about 11 hours at a time, just staring down at, at the pole. And then it will execute. Uh, a lower uh, lat uh, latitude swings for the, uh, the other part of its orbit. So this offers some um, advantages, but now you're even at a higher uh, altitude. Uh, and so, again, trying to look in detail at given areas is a little bit harder on the instrumentation. Of course, we have weather satellites up in GEO, and now you're getting pretty far up, 35,000 kilometers instead of 800 kilometers. You can see the full disk, uh, and, and you'll be fixed looking at the same place all the time, which is good if you're trying to track fast-moving events. Um, but it's not, you know, it's it's much harder on the instrumentation to really have high uh, high resolution glimpses of any particular place. And the same thing is true of L1. So we've the Earth scientists, especially through this Discover instrumentation and satellite would like to go up and sit at L1, where now you can get a full daytime view of the, of the, of the, uh, the, daytime view of the whole Earth. And, um, but again, now you're 1.5 million kilometers away, and, and uh, the instrument issues that you have get you know, more and more uh, challenging. And just to, to make that point, just this is a comparison of Earth views. Uh, if you're a geo, uh, you need about a one degree half angle to get California. Uh, if you're at L1, then it's a 0.1 degree half angle to try to see it out there. And, and so that translates, of course, to your, tr your, your challenges with your instrumentation and getting good sensitivity to whatever it is you're trying to measure. OK, so the cost of all these things. So that's sort of the portfolio. Ooh, it looks like that got wrecked. Um, that's the portfolio of the kind of platforms that uh, the NASA Earth Science can deploy. Um, and so if you. In one of the slides, you said that NASA was using airships already. Did I misinterpret that? Yeah, I, I put it on there, but they are not. They, they, I, I, don't, I don't know personally of any time that NASA has used an airship. We've done it in collaboration with 
tethered, uh, tethered ships, but from other agencies' contributions. Was it discussed seriously in the Oversight Committee? Uh, no, I think we're, we're on the leading edge of that right now, as far as I know. <laughs> So if you're trying to get some regional coverage and, and asking yourself how much does it cost, I've taken some WAGs. Don't take these numbers too seriously. And my, my slide got a little uh, wrecked going to the Mac, I think. But you, know, you can get, so on, a, on a, uh, an area scale per day of observation, uh, you, know, you get a lot of bang for the buck in a conventional aircraft uh, for the money. Um, relative to some of these others. You know, if you want to go to Lagrange or, you know, a typical, uh, even a LEO satellite, even if we do it, you know, venture class is 150 million, sort of a single instrument LEO satellite nowadays can cost anywhere from 300 to five, six, 800 million, depending on the uh, complexity of the instrument. And, and it goes up from there, basically. Um, and, you know, you don't, you don't get a lot more coverage uh, for your money on a regional scale, and so that's the challenge. You either have to get wider swath widths uh, and scanning and slewing rates on your instruments. You've got to make much more sophisticated instruments to up your regional observations from satellites. I, so I'm just trying to put a fine point to probably something you, you innately figure, but, um, but it this is the kind of comparison that will make an airship look good if we're trying to go for long duration coverage over a, an area. I think that an airship can be quite competitive with conventional aircraft and up this number and have a, you know, a very nice payload as well. So, so I think that's my, probably my biggest takeaway point of this, this talk today. Yes? So the, you know, depending on the launch vehicle you want to put up there, uh, somebody in the audience want to help me, but I think, uh, uh, oh, yeah, uh, you know, the, some of our radar instruments are probably heavier than that. They can be up to like a thousand kilograms, I would say. You know, since it's a ROM, yes. The the. <laughs> The operations costs are usually a small, you know, uh, well, they're significant, but they're a small fraction of the total cost. They're typically only 10% of the total cost, as it turns out. Because, you know, the launch vehicles these days are 100 million or better. The ops costs are usually 5 or 10 million a year. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah, so I, I, I hesitate to speak for everyone that was on that list, but I do believe that NASA owns all of them. So, but, and this is, a, this is a really important point in favor of airships, is that most of the most expensive aircraft that NASA owns were developed by the military, and NASA benefited by having them given to us and take over ownership. The, U, the ER-2s are like that. Um, you know, uh, the WB-57s are like that. Um, the Global Hawks are like that. Uh, so the fact that airships have had that sugar daddy that have actually you know, done all the, the heavy lifting to make them uh, viable platforms is huge. Um, the smaller commercial ones you know, are, are not so expensive, and, and NASA's picked them up over time. Um, but, you know, it turns out that attempts to commercialize uh, rides on, on commercial platforms has had its challenges for NASA, so they've tended to want to own them. I'm not saying that that's going to be the business paradigm in the future, but uh, that's pretty much what it is now.
so it, it depends on the platform. The, the one that I showed you, the WB57, it comes with uh, standard racks that go in the belly um, and standard pods that go on the wings. So there people could design to sort of plug and play. That's not true of all of those aircrafts on there. You, you do do a lot of tailoring for some of them, especially the ER2s, because they have pretty severe restrictions on weight and, and, and uh, volume. So, it's, you know, it's sort of a, it's a mixed bag for that. Okay, so uh, I want to finish by simply saying that what we're realizing in earth science is that observations still are, you know, probably the most important thing that you've got to do. But if you really want to make the science uh, sing with the, the applications and what people really, the information people really need, it's, it's a combination of taking data, the right kind of data, whether it's satellite or airborne uh, or airships, um, combining it with other information sources, whether they're citizen science or whether they're ground-based. Um, but you, you need sort of a contextual, you need sort of the regional scale, and then you need to be able to put it in a sophisticated uh, forecasting tool that can make forecasts or predictions. That's what people need to, to plan, uh, plan their decisions. So it's, it's really this whole chain of events that have to occur to really make for um, the kind of usable information. So I, I mentioned that it's, it's, it's really tr is a system engineering problem at some level. And so my colleague, uh, Riley Duran, uh, has contributed to this talk a little bit, and he couldn't be with us today. He, he would echo this point that you've got to system engineer this um, in terms of the way you, you take observations and use them. And so I'm going to finish by just motivating it potentially some of our conversations through the week. Um, there's a couple of ideas for system engineering monitoring systems um, that particularly could use airships. And so Riley has, has contributed a couple of these. One is a, a global carbon monitoring system. Um, the thought here is that um, if you want to tr understand how emissions are changing in the globe, well, you can try to measure the whole globe, or you can recognize the fact that about 80% of the emissions are coming from just certain locations. And, and so an observing strategy that really just tries to, to walk around in the areas of the largest emissions can actually get you 80 to 85% of the way there. And that's a much more tractable, tractable um, observational thing that airships may very much play a very important part in a strategy to do that. The other one that I want to leave you with, again from Riley, is climate thresholds. So you probably have all heard that in a, in a warming world, the canary in the coal mine looks to be um, the Arctic. And there's lots of things that can change in the Arctic in terms of melt, permafrost, carbon emissions out of the permafrost, you know, you've heard about uh, the sea ice melting so that you can actually, you know, there's a navigable way through the, uh, the Arctic Circle. Now, uh, sometimes in summer, that might become a permanent feature. Um, some of these effects may be fairly irreversible. And so we need the data to tell us what the trends really are. And that can include things like uh, surface albedo changes, ice cover, um, uh, sea surface winds, um, there's, there's lots of different things, uh, currents, changing currents. Um, there's lots of processes that are codependent on each other in this region. And, and, we're, and the community really needs some sort of a, a very focused observational approach to this that you really can't get with just one satellite streaking overhead. Um, this is a tough thing to really look at over a, a long, you know, seasons or over a year with aircraft. Um, the staging of a conventional aircraft is a very difficult thing to contemplate here. Um, we are doing, JPL has a mission called CARV that is, is uh, going up occasionally up to Alaska 
and trying to look at changes in the, in the boreal forest and, uh, and the peat uh, with carbon emissions, seeing what the sensitivity to warming is in terms of carbon emissions from the natural state. But it's just you know a couple of times uh, per year for a few weeks. Uh, to really look at this whole thing in a more comprehensive fashion is going to require longer duration platforms with the right assembly of instrumentation. So these are two examples. There's probably more from the audience. Um, and, and then trying to synergize these with the astronomy uh, desire so that it can maybe uh, you know, co-manifest these things, I think is a great challenge for us this week. With that, I'll take a question. Go ahead.